So our next speaker will be Mar Marvin Hoche, which will be talking about neural ODEs in hydrology. So take it away. Thanks a lot. Um, so my name is Marvin. I'm a postdoc at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology, and I will present the work of me and my colleagues on neural ODEs in hydrology as an example of using SIML software in applied sciences. So in its core, hydrology is about understanding and predicting the water cycle. As you can see on the right-hand side scheme of a river catchment, this water cycle comprises numerous interrelated processes. For instance, starting on the very right with evaporation, water enters the atmosphere, rains down, and gets channeled back into a larger water body. On that track, river discharge, also known as stream flow, is the central quantity in hydrology. Knowing about stream flow behavior is particularly important at the extremes of the water cycle during droughts or floods. Therefore, one major objective in hydrologic modeling is to predict and forecast the stream flow over time. As you can see in this example discharge time series for some random catchment, the blue model prediction matches the dots that represent discharge observations pretty well. The other major objective is to understand the processes within the system and to extrapolate them. That means to learn traceable relations or to transfer knowledge from one catchment to another. It also means being able to estimate the effects of hydrometeorological extremes like droughts or floods, and in the broader context, as we've also heard before, to assess climate change impacts. Traditionally, this is done with so-called conceptual models, often also called bucket models. These are based on the mass balance between inputs and outputs of the catchment and are formulated as ODEs. As you can see in the central scheme, there are forcings like the precipitation and temperature that drive the system. The gears represent the processes within the system and the output stream flow is modeled as a function of the model states. The advantages of such models are their physical basis and the interpretability and traceability of all processes. This is also important because data scarcity is a common challenge in hydrology. It is hard to impossible to fully equip entire catchments with devices to monitor all potential processes. So scientific assumptions have to be encoded to close that knowledge gap. The downsides of such models, however, are that um, good predictions require a lot of fine tuning and reiteration of the model setup. So, it is usually difficult to use a model that was fitted on one catchment in other catchments. There's simply no generic model setup that works in every case. Recently, machine learning models became very popular in hydro hydrology and they have pros and cons opposite to the conceptual hydrologic models. They show highest predictive accuracy and come with transferability between catchments. However, their interpretability is limited and the representation of physics within the models remains hardly traceable. The models are either purely machine learning based, like with the long short-term memory LSTM neural network being the approach that has gained most traction in hydrology, or they are hybrid schemes, like the one shown in the center of the slide, where the output of a plain conceptual model serves as additional input to a convolutional neural network aside of the forcings. Compared to that, our hydrologic neural OD approach is also somehow hybrid, but stays within the conceptual model framework. To the OD basis, we add the flexibility of the neural network and can thereby avoid fixed assumptions about processes or potential limitations within the model. A starting point, we use a simple hydrologic model called XP Hydro, and this one has only two states for snow and water storage and comprises five processes. There is snowfall as direct input to the snow storage and rain as direct input to the water storage, and melting is the exchange flux between these two states. Both evapotranspiration and discharge are outputs from the water storage. So we can simply write down the model as two coupled ODEs. Note that there are much more sophisticated models with more states and processes, but as said, there is no general model setup. In the plain conceptual model, each process is described by a fixed process equation as shown here for discharge, for example. In the original XP Hydro model, discharge depends solely on the water storage. 
uh, some variables um, and or some parameters and some additional relation for peak flow. This holds similarly for all other processes with ET or melting being also dependent on temperature, for example. In our approach, we replaced the terms of the right-hand side of the ODEs by feed-forward neural networks, or one in that case. Each of the five output nodes is assigned one specific process. The neural network has four inputs, which are the two external forcings, temperature and precipitation, and the internal model states of water and snow. This way, it is possible that the network also learns interrelations of the variables and their mutual impact on the processes. And this is what the model core in Julia looks like. First, we interpolate the external variables to make them time continuous. This is also not typical with machine learning methods in hydrology because the other shown approaches operate on discrete time steps. Then there's the neural network, which with its four inputs in the following lines, the output nodes are then put together to represent the processes in the ODEs using some transformations and activation functions. And I want to highlight here that this approach also allows to specifically take in physical variables exactly at the place where you want them to be. Here we take the length of day, L day, only as a factor to the ET term, as you can see in the bottom line center. This is a fixed physical value for a certain latitude and time, and it regulates transpiration of water by plants. So we also only want to have it act on this term and not as other input to the network. We applied this generic model setup to 569 catchments for which we have daily data of stream flow, precipitation, temperature, and so on. The data is from the so-called CAMELS data set that covers several hundreds of catchments all over the United States. And as shown on the right-hand side, you can see the distribution of mean daily discharge. For each catchment, we trained our model on 20 years of daily data and then evaluated the performance on the next 10 years. Therefore, we used uh, three criteria to measure accuracy in different flow regimes. First, we used the so-called Nash-Sutcliffe efficiency to assess overall flow and or flow prediction performance. And this one is based on squared residuals and has the optimal value one. This was also our loss function in training. So the model was optimized for overall flow. During testing, we also used something called percent bias in flow duration curve, high segment volume to assess peak flow bias as bias measure the optimum is of course zero. Finally, we measured flow flow performance with a modified NSE that takes the absolute rather than the squared residuals, but has the same range and optimum as the original Nash Sutcliffe efficiency. And here is what we got. Each column refers to one of the flow segments and the histograms show the corresponding metric values for all 569 catchments. Each line represents one machine learning model and the upper and central line um, refer to LSTM and the convolutional network models introduced before. The results for these two models are from the benchmark study by Jang et al. The bottom line shows the results from our neural ODE model. And as you can see, this model shows state-of-the-art performance. In this task of catchment-specific training and testing, the LSTM model in the top line performs worse than the other approaches. But um, you should note that LSTM research in hydrology has made much progress over the last years and remains state of the art with best predictions in other tasks. Here in this task, the convolutional neural network performs already better in all metrics. And then our neural ODE model shows similar results to that for overall flow, as you can see in the lower left in red, but it shows again an improvement over the other models when it comes to peak and low flow in specific. None of these models are very close to the optimum values of the respective metrics, but this is very common in hydrology since observations are often subject to large uncertainty. So for example, Nash Sutcliffe efficiency values above 0.6 are already considered good. This improvement of the neural ODE approach is even more significant when compared to the original 
plain conceptual model, where you can easily see that the neural ODE model outperforms it in every aspect. The nice thing now is that with the neural ODE approach, we can also look at individual processes. On the left, the dependence of this charge to the water storage variable is shown for an example catchment. And as you can see, the fixed relation of the conceptual model in gray shows an increase that is too strong and therefore leads to an overestimation of discharge for high water storages. The learned relation of our neural ODE model, on the other hand, covers the range of observed discharges much better, which also leads to better flow metrics. On the right-hand side, you can see heat maps showing the dependence of discharge on rain and water storage. And for the conceptual model, there is only a dependence on water storage on the y-axis. The neural ODE shows a similar trend, but the discharge magnitude also depends on rain. Now here, for larger rain values on the x-axis, there appears to be a small decline in discharge, which could either be counterintuitive behavior in the catchment or simply lack of training data points in that high storage, high rain regime. Nonetheless, our framework specifically allows to investigate such relations. So in summary, we can say that this neural ODE model provides many of the desired features of a hydrologic model. It keeps the ease of interpretability and traceable physics, and it provides state-of-the-art predictive performance, and that even as continuous time solution, which as said is not given for other machine learning approaches in hydrology. And finally, the generic model sub setup is highly transferable between catchments. So we think that the neural ODEs therefore have a high potential in hydrology. They provide a new level of conceptual modeling because processes do not have to be hard coded, but could be learned by neural networks. Of course, they can be kept fixed if desired, and this allows all kinds of combinations of variations. Neural ODEs demonstrate high predictive performance while being interpretable interpretable. The hydrologic community has developed lots of tools to analyze individual processes for plain conceptual models and can now apply these tools to the neural ODE approach in a very similar fashion. And finally, the generic model setup already led to good results over numerous individual catchments, but also allows us to conduct large sample studies that simultaneously include multiple catchments. This is the current trend in machine learning, and our approach could help us to find better relations that are uh, there better than those that are known today. Yeah, so, so yeah. With that, thanks a lot, um, especially to the community that provides all these cool tools. Uh, if you want to take a closer look into that research, feel free to check out the preprint that is currently part of the submission process, and also feel free to get in touch. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, yeah, so we got a lot of questions for you in, in the discourse. So let me pull one up here. Um, so one question was, right, so you had very, very nice results, right, you know, showing more, more accuracy and everything. Uh, this came out really well, but one of the things that we'd be interested to know is how fast is the learned neural ODE compared to the original model or the other, you know, model types? So the forward runs are incredibly fast, but um, the calibration takes quite a bit of time, that is true. So far, we, we ran that on only a CPU with about 2.3 uh, uh, gigahertz, and it took a few hours to, to calibrate it, to train it. But we're working on that. I think we have not fully exploded all the speed up options that we have. And um, yeah, and we, we could definitely talk about speed on you know discourse and everything. But um, another question that I see is that in the benchmarks, uh, do you normalize by size of, of uh, network? So for example, is the performance improved because of an inherent mo better modeling approach or you know, is it because of deeper, uh, using a deeper neural network model? So far not. So for um, all the different approaches like the LSTM approach or ours, we, we optimized the, the architecture of the networks that we used. And with that optimized already, uh, architecture, we then also performed all our model runs. Cool. And another question here is, uh, how important is interpretability in hydrology? I would say it's uh, extremely important, and this is especially the feature that is lacking in um, other machine learning approaches, uh, 
there are people working on that and there's made much progress. But uh, with our approach, we introduce a new one that has that direct interpretability um, like other conceptual models where you can directly say a certain term in my ODE reflects evapotranspiration and can therefore also be tested when conditions change as during climate change. Yeah, um, another question is, is there any plan for, uh, in the future for an application with a semi-distributed model? Um, not so far, but I'm happy to discuss the idea. Yeah, and um, what, are, what are some next steps that you see in, in your work? You know, are you going to be integrating things like symbolic regression or what are, what are some, some real world problems that you'll be solving with this? Can you describe yep. where, where, where this work will be going? So uh, using symbolic regression tools is definitely one of the next steps because now that our network kind of learned to extract the relations, uh, we would like to decode them and then finally get uh, to, to simple symbolic equations that we can also play around with as we usually do with the conceptual model equations. So that is definitely one route to go. And the other one I, I mentioned is that and this is a big thing in hydrology right now is large sample studies where you take many different catchments into account during training such that you get kind of like universal hydrologic laws that, that hold over various different conditions in terms of uh, climate conditions of catchments and so on. And we're working on that because then we could also solve that problem of having just um, scarce data on very extreme conditions like as shown for for peak flow or very low flow sometimes you just have only a few measurements but you will need more to get reliable relations for flood prediction for example yeah so i think that, that this connects with one of our other questions here which is um uh, also can you can you explain something about the amount of data used for training how many examples did you use to train the model and how many bytes typically is in a data set for you so um, for the, the task that I just presented, we used these 20 years of daily data, which is about uh, uh, 7,300 data points for, for training. And then uh, for the testing, we, we used half of that. And um, with going to multiple catchments, we of course would um, expand that by far because we have access to hundreds of different catchments, right? We could have tens of thousands of, of data points to train. Um, another thing that would be interesting here, but where the databases is not as extended so far, is to go to higher temporal resolutions, which would definitely be very interesting because, for example, flood events occur within hours sometimes or within minutes and, and not over average daily values. Yeah, so another question we have is, um, how, do you how, how do you think uh, neural networks would work for more complex models and, and more processes and parameters? Um, that is a question we're also looking into. So um, this framework is applicable to all kinds of conceptual models that are out there. And the most sophisticated ones, um, they already they also lead to, to very good results, but um, not as good as the ones we get with machine learning. And those uh, sophisticated conceptual models have several dozens of parameters and also uh, multiple states. So we have not tried it yet, but we would definitely be interesting in, in, in um, trying to boost these models too with our neural ODE approach. Yes, and I think that uh, last question here, um, Marvin, th that's this is very interesting research. Um, in the beginning, you showed a time series with large spikes. How well does your neural ODE model predict these? Um, the, the, the beginning plot that I showed was actually the, um, the output of that um, neural ODE model. So, so I think most of the time we get much better results than you get with the other, especially machine learning um, models because uh, they struggle with peak flow predictions. And um, overall, we also get very good peak flow performance measures um, there, as you could see with the peak flow bias, for example. So we see high potential there to, to match these peak flows even better once we have more training data and then more sophisticated um, um, also like process representations. And that would be a key thing to predict uh, floods and stuff. All right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. 